for my unkempt appearance. I literally just flew in from the airport and uh, yeah, a little tired. But um, so Brian gave a fantastic talk on the past and the historical context of Plato, not just as a, an educational system, but of its importance in the development of social technologies that we take for granted today. My talk here is bringing that forward into the present by providing a Plato system for the retro computing community at large that virtually every retro computing system can use and we can all use together to create something really that I think is really very interesting. So, since Brian went over most of the historical aspects of Plato itself, I can take and skip over those and concentrate mostly on the things that Irata actually takes and brings to the table. But what do we have here? Irata Online. It's an online service that you can connect to if you have a computer, preferably a vintage machine, with some way to get it onto the internet. This includes a uh, ESP8266 Wi-Fi modem or a real modem connecting to an internet gateway of some sort or even a, uh, even a, a full-blown Ethernet card that you can find on the Commodore 64 or on Apple II devices. Um, once you have that, you have a system that, by all appearances, looks like a um, looks like something you would see out of, say, Quantum Link, or a CompuServe or AOL. Except this is all built on Plato technology, and as you can see here from the login page that we have here, we've gone quite a bit beyond VT100. We have a graphical display, which as Brian mentioned before, is 512 pixels by 512 pixels with text, with the added advantage that this text can be placed at any pixel point in those 512 by 512 pixels. We have everything that Brian was alluding to in the Plato system in the form of multiplayer games, chat and forums, etc. But one thing that was not mentioned too much is that, well, yeah, I, I guess to a, to, to a certain extent, but something that I'm trying to play up a lot more, Errata and Plato and Cyber One have a built-in development environment so that users can take and create their own software for other people that log on to the system to be able to use. So we can all create our own content together that all of these different vintage machines, be they uh, Atari 800, Commodore 64, Apple II, whatever, they all can use so long as there's a terminal available. And that's actually one of the things that I'm actually working on. I am in the process of developing a whole bunch 
of terminals. I have 12 different terminals that I'm all developing from the same basic code base. But more on that later. So as we can see here, we can see different shots from some of the different terminals that we have available. Of course, we have uh, the software that CyberOne.org uses to connect to it. PTARM works just as well. And if you have a Windows-based machine, Linux, Mac, it doesn't matter. That works just as well. But I already also have alpha versions of terminals for the Commodore 64 and for the Apple II. And you're seeing output form from each of them right here. Uh, you see different screenshots from things like Air Fight, uh, from Avatar, etc. And as you can see here, even though the Commodore 64, for example, only has a 320 by 200 display, we're able to take and squeeze a decent Play-Doh display into that using some very clever image processing techniques. And you can see right here a Commodore 128 running a special version of the software which actually outputs a full Plato screen. So there's that. Um, so what was Plato? Won't go into that because we've already been here. So we'll take and just skip over that. Plato innovations, much the same thing, covered in exhaustive detail from the previous talk. I would like to take a moment here and have special thanks to CyberOne.org because without the CyberOne.org organization and the people which comprise it, Errata Online would not exist. Sometime in the middle of last year, they put together a version of the system, a complete Plato installation with an emulator to match, already configured for the system, and not only did that, but got the rights to be able to release this into the public domain with the, with the stipulation that you could not use it for profit. That it was for your own use, essentially. I took this distribution and spent a considerable amount of time customizing it for the retro computing community, trying to take and make something a bit easier to use than the built-in author edit mode that you're presented with by default on CyberOne.org. And I've already talked with the CyberOne.org people to also take and provide them a copy of this as well. So it will be available there as well. So without their, without their tireless work there, this would not exist. So I have to thank them for this. And of course, it goes without saying, if you want any information whatsoever on the historical context of Plato, I cannot stress this enough to read Brian's book. This is a fantastic book. He spent so much time compiling all of the information inside of here, and it's, it's gold. And I want to say here that this book is the reason that I started doing and contributing to the Plato community in the form of errata, in the form of writing these terminal programs to give something back. It inspired me, so thank you. So, moving on, we'll talk a little bit about what's being emulated here. Um, what we have, uh, CyberOne.org, we'll kind of go, f we'll, we'll, we'll start digging down into the layers a little bit here. We're running on some fairly standard PC server hardware. This PC server hardware is running an emulator. And this emulator is emulating a control data CDC Cyber 17865 supercomputer. A little bit about this machine, um, it was big. Not just in terms of floor space, it was, uh, but in terms, of the, uh, in terms of the system model. It was a 60-bit machine, that is 6-0. The size of the RAM, the size of the registers. Um, it's, it's absolutely, uh, there's a direct correlation with it and the later machines that Cray would develop in form of the Cray 1, Cray 2, etc. They all evolved, they all evolved from this same basic architecture that he started with the 6600 machines up to the 7600 machines up into the cyber based machines that ultimately would be the mainstay of uh, Plato's uh, system, de uh, system design. 
And in fact, the cyber design was so ingrained that when uh, CERL needed new hardware, they ultimately, before they, before they decided to port it off onto other machines, they wound up building their own version of a much more extended CDC cyber machine, which they codenamed Zephyr. Hand-built, uh, ECL wired logic, insane. But that's really how, in, how deeply ingrained this system model actually was. Uh, the machine itself has uh, either one or two central processors doing the majority of the calculation work. But there are also a number of what are called peripheral processors, either 12 or 24, depending on the system configuration. Each of these per peripheral processors are responsible for taking and moving data in and out, not only from the keyboards and the inputs from each user and out to the display, but it was also responsible for taking and uh, dealing with shifting data to and from the disk, as well as from the extended memory storage, or ECS. Now, interestingly enough, one very important uh, design decision that they made, you heard Brian talk about this concept of the fast round trip. This design methodology was so pervasive that the system went through every contortion that it possibly could to avoid writing to the disk. Only when it needed to. And everything was kept in memory for as long as it possibly could. So, again, this led to an extremely responsive machine. So with that, we'll go ahead and um, I'll, I will take and mention one small little detail about the emulated environment here. I am running this on what I could only describe as the teeniest, tiniest corner of one of the servers in my lab. It is a 24-core machine, and the emulation is using one core. And it only, and I've got approximately 250 gigabytes of very high-speed SSD dedicated to this thing. I am currently, uh, I've currently half-saturated my I.O. subsystem on the cyber, so it has about 6.3 gigabytes of total storage. And I can double that. So like I said, this thing runs on the teeniest, tiniest little corner of my machine. <laughs> and is able to take and service a whole bunch of users, if so wanted. So, with that, we'll go ahead and go into the, uh, we'll go ahead and go into the demonstration here. Now, uh, let's see here. Pardon the mirror view here. <sighs> Getting onto Errata Online is extremely simple. You just need to go to the website. This is rather interesting trying to type here while holding a microphone. I'm usually used to having it on my lapel. Okay, so we have here the Arata Online website. We see a nice big pink sign up button so you can take and get an account really quickly. And I will give anybody an account. Um, you, the uh, website itself is mostly informational. It tries to get across the information as best and as concise as it possibly can. What is this thing? How do you access it? I want to know, know more technical details about the system, etc., etc., etc. So it tells you a little bit about how to take the software that you can get, downloading the terminal software, getting it connected up. And if there is a, if you want to develop a terminal for another system, then no problem. We actually have a tech section which provides not only a complete top to bottom description of the entire Plato protocol, even in HTML format, so you can take and quickly go to each section. 
but the whole thing is completely described. Not only do we have that, but we also have multiple examples of working existing uh, terminals. Hi, Kevin. Um, so you can take one of these bits of code here, modify it for your target system, and get bootstrapped on a new system target very quickly. And in fact, the terminals that I'm writing for various machines are all based on the same basic chunk of C code with system bits just added onto the outside to do all of the system dependent bits, which is why I'm able to do this so quickly. Not only do we have that, but we also have sections for, um, for such uh, interesting little bits of obscurity like MicroTutor. One of the interesting things about Plato, as Brian mentioned earlier, were that the terminals were intelligent. They were microcomputers in and of themselves. They had microprocessors, they had memory, they had I.O. And to a great degree, this also meant that you could download code to the terminal and run code directly on the terminal, either completely self-contained within the terminal itself or communicating back with the central Plato system back and forth. And the technology which they used to implement that was called MicroTutor. Now there's been a great deal of work in recent years on CyberOne.org and their community to take and uncover the mysteries of MicroTutor, what's possible. And so they have a fully working MicroTutor implementation inside PTERM. One of my goals for Errata is to be able to take and do micro-tutor implementations for 6502, for 68000, 6809, so that we can take and have the microcomputers themselves take off some of this processing power and provide the capability to do more, I'm just going to get right to the point, we, we, we want more arcade type games. That's, that's just it. So there, boom, that's the reason. So not only do we have that, but we also have how do we write software for this service? And I have here the two canonical books on Tudor, which show you from top to bottom, with plenty of examples, how to take and use Tudor to write new software inside the Plato system itself. So signing up, again, easy as pie. Go in, and these are the four fields that I'm looking for right here, the bare minimum of what I need to be able to provision the account, because it is me basically provisioning the account back behind it, or uh, at some amazing point in the future when I have system staff, the system staff. Here's the dreaming. So, of course, we need full name, email, the desired sign-on that you want, uh, the nice thing about Plato sign-ons is that they are 18 characters in length and can contain spaces. So you can get pretty descriptive with your sign-on names. There is also what's called the desired group. And this is, at least in the context of modern Plato, it was originally meant to denote different organizations, or different universities perhaps, inside the same system. For us, since this is a vintage computer-themed system, these are all just different uh, vintage-themed computers. So uh, you have Atari, Commodore, Amiga, etc. Now you can only belong to one group at a time. So if you have more than one favorite uh, vintage machine that you like, I'm sorry guys, you're, you're going to have to pick a favorite son. So you're just going to have to. And Atari. yeah, Atari, yeah, there you go. I'm in the Atari group. The other major thing that you can ask for is what's called an author sign-on. An author sign-on is another sign-on that is in the author group. Members of the author group are special because they have access to the development environment inside the system. So it is a secondary sign-on in addition to the normal sign-on that you have. I will give this to anybody who asks, because I want people to make stuff for this system. So 
If you want it, go ahead and check the box. Once you've signed up, I will take and get notification that you've signed up and provision the account for you. Well, once you have that, what do you see? Well, it's something that's going to look a little bit like this. Let's go ahead and... Matter of fact, I'll just go ahead and make this full screen here. Okay. Again, login screen, we can see we've gone way beyond VT100. One thing to note here, it's asking for a username, then press next. Uh, there are a whole bunch of special Plato keys that were on the Plato keyboard that have to be mapped onto whatever terminal that you're using. Under P-Term, if you go to help and you get P-Term keyboard, this is what you see. So, and of course, my little, my handy dandy little, uh, little desktop snapper here. There we go. You can see the different keys here. The Play-Doh keys on the left. Uh, function key equivalents, which I don't use. These are actually the original function key mappings that were brought over into the original IBM PC Plato terminal software. This is PC as in 5150, so it's really old. So um, you also, but the ones that I use most commonly are the control and alt combinations. You'll find that answer is control A, back is control B, copy, control C, etc. So they're mnemonic, they're easy to remember. So we'll go ahead and log in here. If I, have, if I haven't already timed out, if I have, yeah, there we go, okay. Talking too much. So we'll go ahead and log in. Now, um, it's a special note that in addition to being able to have a normal account, if you don't have one yet, maybe I haven't gotten around to provisioning it just yet and you want to try it out immediately, there is a guest account. And if you put guest in for both the username and the group, you get access to the menu system here. This is the menu system that I took and built for Errata Online. And it's hopefully pretty self-explanatory here. We have, uh, we have a menu header. We have a status line here, which gives us a date and time. But right now it also shows, for example, when we have personal notes, they'll pop up, they'll pop up here automatically. Uh, you have the menu options over here on the left-hand side. You have uh, down here a list of keys which are ultimately valid for this particular screen that are special Play-Doh keys, just for reference. And over here uh, on the bottom, you have, uh, these are keys that are global to the entire menu system for things like go to a particular page or lesson or whatever, help, uh, talk o user list, etc. So, the, on the only other thing here is the little logo area that I have on the bottom right-hand corner. And in the main menu, you'll see that we have a next logo here. Initially, this was going to be uh, a specific logo that would be shown depending on what group that you were in. Thing was, I, by the time I was finished doing all of these, I was so proud of what I had done and how they looked that I wanted everybody to see them. So it takes and does them all on random. And if you replot, you'll see them come up one after the other. Now, the Apple one came up here, and I want to take and point out something really special here. You'll notice that the Apple logo has correct colors. There is a reason for this. The protocol that control data specified for the ASCII Plato protocol specifies, and I kid you not, a 24-bit RGB color space. This is in the mid-1980s when there was not a frame buffer on planet Earth that could display it. So, forward thinking or blind luck, who knows? Maybe he does. I don't know. Um, so, more logos, etc. Commodore, etc. Uh, the menu itself is touch sensitive. So, if I were to select a particular item using my finger, It'll go to it. 
We have right here the system bulletins that came with the system here. You can see the effective date here, August 31st, 89. And this is just basically system hours. I'm hoping that they can do something a bit more with this in the near future. Let's go back, push the back button. And let's go to the lesson catalog. This is the official Plato lesson catalog that was distributed by Control Data with every system that they sold to various organizations. There are approximately 16,000 different lessons in here for everything across the board that you could possibly imagine from high school biology to, and I kid you not, how to operate a nuclear reactor. It's, 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 absolutely, it's absolutely amazing. And lest you think that I am being facetious, let's go ahead and find it, shall we? We go ahead and search by subject, put in a few words here. We go nuclear. Okay, we've got subjects on waste treatment, nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy, physics, etc., etc. And then we get down into nuclear physics and look at number six, reactor operators. We drill down into that, and we have basic academic training for nuclear operators. Okay, great, that's number one. We'll take and drill down into that. And at this point, we have a full abstract of this particular lesson. Uh, this is a, you'll notice that this particular lesson was written using uh, PCD3 and the Plato Lesson Management System. So this is one of the things that I'm trying to figure out how to unlock because Plato, the control data had ultimately built an entire framework on top of Tudor for not only speeding up the creation of lessons, but also finally grainly controlling who had access to those lessons and to account their progress through those lessons. And this is one of those such lessons. We can go ahead, since we can go ahead and try this lesson, pressing the lab key. And actually, since I'm running as guest, I can't do that, so we'll just take and skip over that. Guest doesn't have access to all the stuff here, and that's fine. At any time, I can press shift stop, which is a special key uh, combination inside of, um, inside of Play-Doh, which says, get me out of here, punch out. And it will do it right at that point. Even if it's still got other stuff that's it's trying to push through the buffer, since it is actively scanning the keyboard as fast and as often as it can, if you press shift stop while it's still trying to push data, it will detect that you've pressed shift stop to do that and try to stop as quickly as it possibly can. Again, because of the fast round trip that Brian was talking about earlier. So if we go ahead and press data, we come back to the menu. And one of the nice things about the system in general I'll go ahead and log in as my actual account here. Log in as me. I use my full name. And I'm in the Atari group. And since I have a password, it's asking me for my password. And yes, to answer any question you might have there, uh, you, didn't, you didn't provide a password when you signed up. It will ask you for one the first time you log in. So you'll see right here that when I log back in, what it has actually done here, it's put me in the last place that I was in inside the menu. The entire Plato system placed a great deal of emphasis on persisting data. Uh, you could have several layers of persistence inside of a lesson, either in the context of a student, in the context globally, Locally within functions, it was, it, it was extremely flexible in this regard. And I'm using it here to essentially say, okay, if I log off on another menu here, remember which, remember which menu I logged off in and put me back here when I log back in automatically. And I'm here in the notes section. So we'll go ahead and go back. Now I know most of you are coming to this and you guys want to see the games. So let's see the games. We have here a copy, uh, we'll start with Air Fight. 
Airfight is one of my absolute favorites because it really shows how forward thinking all of these kids were on Play-Doh. Airfight is a 3D dogfighting simulation. Uh, yes, correct. 3D, first person, written in 1976 by Bran Fortner, who was a grad student at U of I at the time. And in actuality, if you actually dig into the tutor file for Airfight, you will see that it was actually started two years earlier in 1974. So what you're about to see, especially keep that in mind, we'll go ahead and put ourselves in one of the squadrons, the circle squadron here, and we'll go ahead and pick a plane, lots of planes to choose from, each with their own different characteristics in terms of weight, what payloads they can hold, that sort of thing, which you get a nice little stats display right here. We'll go ahead and select this fighter here and give myself a call sign. How much fuel do you want? Well, this has a bearing on how, much, how many munitions you can put in, but you'll need enough fuel to actually be able to fly around. So I'm, I'm going to go ahead and just say 8,000 pounds of fuel here, which will leave me enough space for enough weight for about 10 missiles. Sure, no problem. Now we're loaded up with 11,000 pounds, and now we're sitting here on the runway. And you'll notice right here, we have a first person display happening right here. We'll go ahead, pull back the stick a little bit, just go ahead and do it ahead of time. Crank up the throttle, crank up the flaps, pull the flaps down. And I'm going to use the next key here to take off. And you can see right there, we're already, bam. This is a uh, this is a multiplayer game. So when you're inside this game with other people, you're basically trying to take and shoot them down. Banking, moving around, etc. So it would be of no surprise here that the guy who wrote Flight Simulator in Flight Simulator 2 ultimately took a look at Air Fight and went, huh. I'd like to see if I can do that on a PDP-11 display, and later on Apple II. 20 years later, you get Microsoft Flight Simulator. <laughs> so that's Air Fight in a nutshell. Some of the other bits and pieces of games here. Another wonderfully iconic game, Avatar. Some of you might think that Wizardry was one of the first serious dungeon-type games that was first person in essence. No, that honor goes back to Avatar and even before Avatar, Oubliette, Pietit V, etc. As Brian was talking about earlier. Now, I've already created my character and defined him. The character is defined using Dun Dungeons and Dragons rules. So you have certain attributes, strength, integrity, etc., wisdom, etc., 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 intelligence, etc. So, and you have a, set, a number of weapons that you have at your disposal that you can take and trigger. That's different points. So let's go ahead. We're in the city right now. Let's go down into the dungeon. And we can see right here that now we have this nice first-person display happening here. Moving around inside the dungeons. Now to take and really pull this point across, now I'm going to take and bring in one of, my other, one of our other terminals here, which is the Atari terminal. Come on. This was the cartridge that Atari wrote and uh, with uh, some help from people from Control Data. We'll take and set the connection parameters here. Oh. Darn it. This is what I'm trying, this is what happens when I type one-handed. Bear with me a little bit. Okay, so we'll go ahead. I'll just deal with the, with the, with the half duplex here. A, T, D, I, errata, dot online. So what we have here inside this Atari emulator is an internet modem that is providing the internet connection and making it appear like a modem connection. We'll go ahead and connect at 1200 bits per second. 
and with a little bit of negotiation back and forth, we'll see the login screen pop up any moment now. So you can see right here, much the same experience with the main difference that we don't have paint. And this is another aspect of the plate of the uh, Play-Doh back end as well. You could tell Play-Doh what type of terminal that you were rendering to. And the framing and format, or, or framat, which is what they called it, would take and output the appropriate control sequences for your terminal automatically, removing, adding or removing features as necessary. So we'll go ahead and log in. And we can see the main menu here. So you can see the same experience. So this is why it is so critical to get terminals for all of these, for all of these various machines so that all these vintage machines can access the service. Um, we'll go ahead and uh, I will go ahead and just go directly to Avatar here to really bring this across here. Since I know the name of the lesson, I will do that. And now we see the dragon being drawn here. These are individual line drawing commands that are coming across at 1200 bits per second to take and draw the various detailed bits of the dragon. So as far as Plato's own drawing model to explain, Plato is a bitmap display with line and dot drawing primitives. For bitmaps, you have character sets, which you can define up to 128 custom characters, which can be used inside your program. And in fact, you can take and swap out character sets at different times. It will take and stream the new character set to your terminal when it's requested by your program. So and in fact, that's actually what it's doing right here when it says giving raw monsters your description. It's actually downloading the character set for the game into the terminal here. And the nice thing about Play-Doh's own character set implementation, these characters do not replace your existing alphanumerics. These are, these are additional characters alongside the existing alphanumerics. So you don't have to play the age-old game of, oh, do I really need the symbols? I can use those and get some extra character space, or, you know, etc. that sort of thing. So now we go ahead and enter into Avatar. And you can see the inventory display being built here. And as you can see here, even at 1,200 bits per second, the performance is still excellent. Again, the emphasis on trying to be as responsive as possible all the time. And it's worth to note here that in actuality, while the line drawing primitives are being used to draw the various boxes and whatnot for the status displays, character set graphics are actually being used to draw the maze, which is one of the reasons why it's being drawn so fast. So, we're both ostensibly in this game together, and we could actually run into each other and either team up or fight each other if we wanted to. But I'm not going to. We've got more stuff to see here. So we'll go ahead and just kind of bounce out here. So I gave you, in a nutshell, two example games that are very iconic games on, uh, on, on Plato. And I know that there's somebody out there, those of you watching, you know, watching at home, whatever, that's saying, what about Empire? What about Empire? Empire is here too. And for those who want to take and dig and look into that, it's definitely worth looking into. And we can see somebody actually, actually jumped into Avatar here and is uh, talking to me here. All right. So, uh, some of the other bits and pieces here. Of course, Brian talked about uh, Brian talked about notes, and the way that notes actually worked 
it's a little bit different from forum systems that you see today in that because Plato itself is full screen and it doesn't scroll, the notes themselves are also formatted in the context of being full screen. A note is one page long. And if you need more notes, well, yeah, you tack on a reply. But it, I think in that, in a lot of ways, it allows you to be uh, extremely, uh, you know, ex extremely terse and to the point. We pick a note here by specifying its number, and we can see uh, a release announcement for the new version of Plato Term that I just released a few days ago. This is a terminal emulator that is uh, being written for roughly 12 different machines, and the first two out of the gate are the Apple II and the Commodore 64. And the uh, terminal itself is extremely compatible. For example, the Apple II will work on an Apple II Plus with 48K of RAM. It uses the escape key as a toggle for both control sequences and upper and lower case. So, uh, you also have Commodore 64, and I have a Commodore 128 version on the, on the way as well. So, I mean, as you can see, bam, that this, is, this is notes in a nutshell. Not only do you have uh, general notes, that can be either public, shared with a group, or with a small group of people, whatever. You also have uh, what are called uh, personal notes. And you can think of these in the context of email between users of the system. And a matter of fact, I will go ahead and do this next little bit here with P-term. We'll go ahead and stop data here. We'll go, oop, no, 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 no. Pardon me here. Going into notes. Let's go ahead and send something to Bob, sure. Bob in the Atari group. On this system here. Hi from VCF West. Okay. Ready, we're done. Shift next. Pardon me. <laughs> Darn it. This requires two hands. Now once this is sent, our display over here immediately updates and we see that we have personal notes. We go ahead and we can select E to read them. And it takes us right to them. Straight to the point. Now for this next bit, and for the last bit of what I'm trying to show here, I'm actually going to take and log into the authoring environment and show you a little bit of the programming environment that's available inside this system. So uh, we'll go ahead and shift stop, shift stop. Go ahead and log back in. We'll go ahead and log in with the author group. I'll log in. You'll notice that instead of using my usual group, I use the author group name. And what we see here, if you've logged on to Cyber One or familiar with Cyber One, this is the edit environment, which is the text editor that's actually part of the system here. So you kind of have to know where you're going and what you're going to be doing. So for this here, we'll take and type in the lesson for an Othello game that I'm working on here. You can see the game running here. We'll take and stop it here. And since this is my lesson, I have the code key for it here. We'll take and log into it. And here is the programming environment in a nutshell. Lessons are divided into parts. You can think of parts like disk sectors. And each of those parts are divided into individual blocks. Those blocks may be code. They might be graphics. They might be something else entirely. So go ahead, just kind of as a demonstration here, we'll look at section A, uh, section A here on block two, block two A here. 
which is the drawing routines for various different things like drawing Othello pieces and whatnot. And this is Tudor in a nutshell. You see uh, a very space-oriented language indented into columns and very heavily dependent on spaces, but easy enough to get used to when you get your head around it. You, one of the interesting things that you'll see right here is that you can see graphics and text being mixed together seamlessly in a full screen text editor in the 1970s. So, um, let's say we're taking and modifying something here. Uh, say line number 27 there. And I want to take and add a mode command here. Uh, mode, mode, mode. What are the different types of modes? Well, you've got what are called terms by pressing the term key. And you can think of terms as desk accessories on steroids. One of these terms is help. And if we go ahead and ask for help on the mode command, we see right here context sensitive help dropped into the system. And in fact, this can be used anywhere inside the system. This is not unique to the text editor. This can be used anywhere. And once it's done, it drops you right back into the editing environment, right where you're typing. So you can continue typing. Oh, I want to use inverse. And you go on. Not only that, but the overall system documentation is also written in Tutor. So not only is the documentation in this system documentative and referential, but also instructive and interactive. And I have to say, in my 30 some odd years in this industry, there are very few examples of things that I can point to in terms of documentation and the quality of documentation that was created by the Plato team to describe how this system works and more importantly how to program it. Hats off to them. It's amazing. And so on and so on. The documentation is wonderful. So you can get the bits of information that you need and you can back out and go right back into the text editor so that you can continue doing your work. Not only that, but as was sort of uh, alluded to earlier, there are all sorts of collaboration functions built into the system. Not only do you have the ability to have notes files for programming teams that do things back and forth, or for users of your system. But you also have term talk. So I'll press the term key again, type talk. Enter Bob's name here, because I want to talk to Bob. Go to the Atari group here. And you'll see right here that we have a notification that we want to take an answer. Boom, talk. And at this point, we now have a two-line talk, two talk screen here. Come on. Come on. There you go. OK. So hi, Bob. Hi, Tom, etc. And you'll see, as he mentioned earlier, it literally works and echoes as you type. One of the features that we have down here on the uh, bottom of the screen here, we've got, of course, clear line and exit. OK, fine. But we also have monitor mode for screen sharing. What if I want to take and share my screen of what I'm working on so that Bob can see and perhaps critique on something? All I have to do at that point is press Shift Lab to share my screen. And the moment that I refresh my screen, we will see my screen being reflected over onto the other terminal. There's also even a variation of this called conferencing, which by the time that they actually retired NovaNet, conferencing had the ability to reach up to 300 people at once with this screen sharing feature. So you have screen sharing, you have all of these things, but you also have all of these other little tools 
that not only coders can use, but artists can use as well. The character set editor, so that you can draw Othello characters, characters for your game. The ability to take, deal with them interactively, put turn bits on and off. Not only that, but you can deal with much larger sets, multiple character sets. We can see the individual characters that comprise this character set over here, and as well as the preview right here. Press data. And now, well, I guess that kills my presentation because my battery just died. Dun -dun 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 -dun. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thanks, guys. So with the last few minutes that we have here, does anybody have any questions? I really wanted to show the Commodore 64 and Apple II terminals, but because I have them on here. But anyway, yeah. Well, I can't speak too much about that because I was not around during that time. It's a, so basically, he's, his question was, how would you compare the performance of a Play-Doh system today and what we saw today in the demonstration with Play-Doh machines and the environments, the terminals, etc., of the contemporaneous time of the 1970s? And, yeah, well. It's obviously faster. If you have P-Term, you have access to a fast TCP connection, so that's much faster. But you saw also on the emulated machines, like the Atari, for example, and well, the Commodore 64 and Apple II terminals, those run at 1,200 to 2,400 bits per second. And you saw even there that the performance there was actually fantastic. So, you yeah, know, within reason. Yep. No, no, the, the Microfish projector did not make it into the uh, Play-Doh 5 PPT terminal, so th those things were pretty much only exclusive to the Play-Doh 4 terminals, at least to my knowledge. Any other questions? Again, thank you guys so much for allowing me to do this. Uh, this has been absolutely fun, and there's so much more to come. And like I said, if my battery hadn't died, I would have actually shown you some of the other terminals and whatnot. The terminals are available. You can get them on the website. I have them currently for Commodore 64, Apple II, Atari 800, as well as the P-Term terminals for Windows, Mac, and Linux. And... Um, uh, more to come. I have an Android client that I have running here on my phone in my pocket, and I have an iOS client that I'm working on as well. And there's also a JavaScript client in the works. So, accessibility is a number one concern. Uh, I wish I could have gone into more of the archaeological aspects because there's a lot to do there. There is 30 years worth of code that we need to take and dig into and discover and see what actually how it works and how to make it and, and how to use it. Further proving to the point that you that Kermit went everywhere. Plato had a Kermit implementation. It's on my system, and it works. So it, that's just one crazy example. There's also uh, machinery to take and, and bounce uh, notes between different machines. That has to be discovered. So on and so on. So if anybody has any questions, you guys just feel free to hit me up. You can see my shirt and. Um, uh, if you want to, if, if you're curious about something, if you want to help about something, please just hit me up. And I'm, I'm, I'm bringing this out here because I'm interested and I want people to be interested in all of this. Again, thank you guys so much. <laughs>